Please open your Bibles to the book of John. We want to look as we are studying through this book at verses 14 through 18 of John chapter 1. Verses 14 through 18. You'll notice as we go from week to week on this that we do repeat scriptures as we show their bearing upon other scriptures that we begin to look at. And we're simply calling these passages, 14 through 18, They Beheld His Glory. Notice what we have, beginning in verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of Him and cried, saying, He was... This was he whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. I think it's quite clear that in these last few verses of the introduction, if you want to call it that, or some have called it the prologue, to John's gospel account that the apostle identifies the Word. First of all, the Word is who was in the beginning with God and was God, verses 1 and 2 of John 1. The Word through Him or through whom all things were made. That's found in verse 3. Then you notice the word. Well, this is the word that was life and is the light of men. Verses 4 and 5 and verse 9. The word who came into the world, though many did not receive him. Verses 10 and 11. Yet we do learn that those who did receive him were given the right, and mark that down, those who received him were given the right to become children of God, verses 12 through 13. We give emphasis again to the fact that the Word was Jesus Christ. He became flesh, He dwelt among men, as we talked about this morning, then He is as much man as you are or I am, that is, a human being. His glory was seen by men, according to verse 14, and this introduces us to a great word. The glory is one of those words that we may use from time to time, especially in reference to God or our resurrected bodies at the end of time. But we find it sort of hard to define what it is. But it has to do with sort of a summation of, of the majesty and dignity and splendor, power and might of God. It's the glory of God. Now, when pertaining to Christ, then you see it really pertains to his personal excellence of majesty in view of who he is, what he did, and where he is. And you might, again, for those that were here, remember what we said this morning. And John writes, we beheld his glory. We beheld his majesty. We beheld his dignity. We beheld his splendor. Others did, of course, at that time, too, as Christ walked among men. They saw what he did, what he said, how he acted, how he dealt with people, and so on. Thus, Christ could say, when you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Now, he was not in a glorified state in the flesh at that time. He came as a servant and came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Yet what we saw or what they saw in him and we see through the scriptures is the very character of God living as a man. So they beheld his glory. They beheld the glory of his deity. Verse 14, the first part of that verse, the glory as of the only begotten Son of God. Now the dignity which was appropriate to only the Son of God. Uh, if you have a chance, you have access to Barnes' notes on this. He has a good discussion of, of this. Such glory or splendor, 
as could belong to no other barns rights and has properly expressed his rank and his character. I probably need to emphasize, you do too, in our own lives and everybody else as we teach the enriching principles of the gospel of peace, how to become more like Christ, is to emphasize what is not emphasized much anymore is one's character. We talk about things being character building. What is your character like? Well, that's how you think. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So the inward man, the spirit that was fathered by God, will return to God when this life is over. Then we can mold it. It's the inward man. And we make it after the will of Christ by our will submitting to his will that we might become like him. This glory was seen eminently on the Mount of Transfiguration, which is recorded at least by Luke, in Luke 9, 28 through 32. And Peter referred back to that in 2 Peter chapter 1, 16 through 18, in writing to Christians to remind them of his most excellent glory he describes on that Mount of Transfiguration. And it was also seen, that is, his glory in his miracles, in his teaching, in his resurrection, in his very ascension, John 2, verse 11. And all of which were such as to illustrate the perfections and thus manifest the glory that belongs only to the only begotten Son of God. Well, they not only beheld His glory as of the deity in the flesh, but they beheld the glory of His favor or His grace. John 1, 14, the latter part of the verse, then verses 16 and 17 talks about Him being full of grace. Grace for grace. Grace and truth came by or through Jesus Christ. I think it's interesting to realize that many people who talk about grace, and you hear it all the time, really have no biblical concept of it. Uh, they don't understand that God's favor is to deliver to us in the terms of the gospel. When Paul is writing to Christians in Rome, he, of course, is reminding them <clears throat> about what they did in becoming Christians. And he will say, as you begin to go into chapter 6, which gets specific as to what they did exactly when they became Christians, and he will point out to them that, in verse 21 of Romans 5, that as sin hath reigned or ruled unto death, it brings about death, Romans 6, 23, even so my grace, now there's a word, grace reigns or rules through righteousness until eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So God's grace, God's favor that's bestowed upon us that we do not deserve, we cannot merit, merit what we deserve is to be condemned eternally in the devil's hell. But God's grace saves us, so Paul wrote to the Ephesians. But it saves us through the gospel. He's not talking about when he says through righteousness the law of Moses. For by the deeds of the law, Paul said, no flesh can be justified. So what righteousness does he have in mind? Well, it's the gospel, God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16. That even makes more sense why Paul would say in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. If it puts me into the light of being a beggar and spoken against and reviled, well, I'm not ashamed of it because it, it's the avenue whereby God saves men from their sins. And that's exactly what Paul's reminding the Romans of when they became Christians to motivate them to greater service. So grace rules through something. And it rules through righteousness, the righteousness revealed in the perfect law of liberty that we're taught in James 1.25 to continue therein, and he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. So you see then that grace is extended to man through the conditions of the gospel, through the New Testament system. Now, of course, as we've said many times, this grace means favor, and it's uh, translated as to gifts, and it has to do with uh, acts of beneficence and so on. Christ himself was kind, he was merciful, he was gracious. He did good to all, and he sought the ultimate welfare 
of man by his own sacrifice of himself and uh, the love that he manifested in that sacrifice. That doesn't rule out the Christ uh, saying, uh, you made my father's house to dinner thieves and calling people exactly what they were according to their character, that they were a generation of vipers. You know, he told them what they needed to hear, and they needed to hear that. And because he loved them, he told them what, what their character was. And you know who could only do a thing about it? The very people whom he addressed that were in that state. Christ gives us what we need, not what we want. So that's characteristic of him, that he abounded in grace or he abounded in favors to mankind. All that there is about Christ is presenting favor to mankind, ultimately saving him from his sins and getting him into heaven. And they beheld the glory of his grace. You might study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John sometime and look at the life of Christ and just focus in on that one thing, the favors he was doing. And he just did favor after favor after favor. Then they beheld the glory of his truth. Truth today has fallen on hard times. People who have always loved to do things their way have never liked the truth much because truth stands outside of us. It doesn't depend on whether you're male or female, old or young or sick or healthy, uh, wealthy or not. It's just what it is. Notice in verse 14, that part of the verse, verse 17, it says, full of truth. And that truth came through Jesus Christ. Well, what truth did he have in mind? Well, it's the truth pertaining to man's salvation. Truth pertaining to how you live on this earth so heaven can be your home. He's not talking about truth as it pertains to chemistry. But, of course, when you get into the laws of science, who spoke them into existence and who upholds them by the word of his power? And that would be Jesus, too. So ultimately, even in all things pertaining to the empirical, then he's behind that also because what? He created everything. Without him was not anything created. Those are all these laws. And he's true to those laws. You know, he spoke gravity into existence. And by the word of his power, it stays working. Aren't you glad? You don't ever have to wonder if when you take a step, if you'll just float off out in space. No, Christ wills for gravity to remain and the law of gravity works. And so everyone of the physical laws or any other law in nature spoken into existence by Christ and kept working until he decides to call the whole material situation to an end. He was also then full of truth. He declared the truth. He lived the truth. Thus he declared what he lived. There was no falsehood whatsoever. Thus he's not like the false prophets and the false messiahs. They were impostors. And he says, check me out. This is the wonderful thing about Jesus. He doesn't say, now I told you what it is. Don't investigate me. He invites full investigation from an honest person to see who I am. And that's a wonderful thing. He wasn't like the emblems or the types or the shadows of the Old Testament. They were only types of the true. But he was truth himself. He represented things as they are, not as you might like them to be or wish them to be. That's the nature of truth. It corresponds with reality. And he represented it just as it was. That's one reason he called those people a generation of vipers. That's what he was. That's the kind of people they were. And we've got to a point nowadays where really do you ever find a wicked person? Do you ever find a person who does wickedly because that's what they want to do and they enjoy it? Well, you say, I can't understand how people would enjoy something like that. Well, I may not understand it, and I may not want to get to the state of mind where I do understand it. But there's a lot of folks who do wicked things, and nearly every one of them are trying to say, it's not my fault. It's somebody else's. But you did it. <laughs> You're the one that out of your mind carried out the actions or didn't do what you were supposed to. It's by your will that you are what you are. In effect, what God is doing with us in the gospel as it's preached to everybody, he, he's, he's like a, a prosecuting attorney. He's saying, you're charged with being a sinner. Now, is the charge accurate? 
when Paul, writing by the Holy Spirit, said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And we know sin's the transgression of the law, 1 John 3.23. So he's charging everybody with having transgressed God's law. And you did it because you chose to do it. God didn't make you do it. We all did it because we wanted to do it. Well, now, what's the situation? Well, the situation is God charges us accordingly. Now, here's where I either am saved by that charge or I'm not saved. He charges me with being a sinner. What am I going to do? I'm going to say the charge is right. I deserve eternal damnation. It's not God's fault. It's not anybody else's fault. Ultimately and finally, it is my fault. I'm in the mess I'm in. And then you see the publican held up as the one, as an example of prayer. He smote his breast, would look toward heaven, and he said, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what God's asking us to do is the gospel comes to us and shows us our sins. Our conscience pricks us. Or we better hope it does, because if it doesn't prick us, there's not any way that we're going to turn from sin and turn to God in obedience to the gospel. So the truth and the truth only about our lives, about our sins, about the way out of sin, that's the only thing that's going to help us. And we need to understand that. He represented things as they are. And you know the church in preaching the gospel must go into a world and represent things as they are. So when people tell me you just don't love folks because you point out the way they are and you show that God wants to save them from the way they are and God loves them and is given the only way for their salvation, then if they are what they ought to be, they will be also, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth command, and I will obey. And look at the people on the day of Pentecost. They came there as devout Jews, doing what they believed God wanted them to do in upholding that feast day of Pentecost. They heard what they never thought they would hear. They heard information preached that proved that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, their Messiah. They had it vouchsafed unto them by the miracle signs and wonders that were done. And they were pricked in their heart by the message because have you noticed he called it like it was ye have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain. That's pretty tough. And they were pricked in their heart and they cried unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And you'll notice then that he points out, save yourselves from this untoward generation. What does that mean? Listen to what God said. Listen to the truth that is Jesus Christ. Because he tells those believers, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. So he, I would say this would be one of the things that needs to be emphasized as greatly as you emphasize anything. He told things just as they were. He didn't try to gloss it over. He didn't make it up to suit what people he might want to hear tell them as they thought they would like to hear it. He just told it as it is. Facts are so important in a matter. As witnessed by John the Baptist, first of all, they also saw the glory of our Lord's preeminence. Verse 15, notice, he who comes after me, John the Baptist says, the forerunner of the Christ is preferred before me. John recognized the superiority of Christ, as did the Apostle Paul in so many ways. By virtue of his preexistence, notice he was before me, John 8, 58, 17, 5, as he says here also. By virtue of his creative power. Listen how Paul wrote it in Colossians 1, 15 through 17. Speaking of Christ, who is the invisible God who's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. 
Isn't that amazing? Whatever's created, whether it's visible or invisible, physical or as you say in philosophy, metaphysical, whatever's created, then Christ created. He is the active agent in the creation. When it says God created, then deity created through the second person of the Godhead. He is the eternal word. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Also, they beheld the glory of his revelation. No one has seen God at any time. But watch, the only begotten of the Son, he hath declared him. John 1 verse 18. This passage is not meant to deny that men had witnessed manifestations of God as when he appeared to Moses and the prophets. You can read about that in Isaiah 6 and Numbers 12. But it meant that no one has seen the essence of deity or has fully known God. The only one that can fully know God is God. He's Christ God. Indeed he is. So he's the one that can declare him because he's the second person of the great Godhead. The prophets delivered what they heard God speak. Jesus delivered what he knew of God and as equal with God and as understanding fully the nature of God. Jesus manifested or declared the Father as no one had ever done before. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And we've explained what that means. As Jesus expressed in his prayer, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. He also talks about having given unto them the words that thou gavest me, I gave to them. Other places he would say, I'm here to do the Father's will. It's all I ever do is the Father's will. I have an assignment. I have a role and it's mine to do. That's what I do. Nothing stands between me and getting done what I as a second person of the Godhead, tabernacling in the flesh, must do to save man. I'm glad he was true to that because he didn't have to be. As the apostles wrote in their epistles, so we are able to see the glory of God. Colossians 1.15, Hebrews 1.1-4. 1, 1 I think that's one of the, I don't know how to say it other than to say one of the prettiest scriptures in the whole Bible, it's the beginning of Hebrews. God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. That's a wonderful thing right there. Notice, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now listen. Who hath, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now John said that, and Paul said it to Colossians. Who being the brightness of, here's our word, glory. And the express image of his person. And upholding all things. Remember that gravity comment I made a while ago? Upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins. Set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Being made so much better than the angels. As he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now listen further. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now that says he'll be equal because he is. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And so on he goes. Notice verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now that's explaining the glory of Jesus Christ. And again, that word sums up a great many things. By His Word and by His Spirit, He can enlighten and guide us and lead us to the true knowledge of God. Thus, we have what is also said, and it was spoken on not long ago in Hebrews 4 and verse 12, which tells us the power 
of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. For the Word of God is quick and powerful. That's alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now that tells me why I'm obligated as a faithful Christian to preach the Word. It'll do that. It'll accomplish when to God sent it. There's no true and full knowledge of God which is not obtained through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So what a wonderful experience it must have been to behold the glory of God's only begotten Son. And we can behold Him today in the inspired Word of the living God. And as Paul said, follow me as you see Christ living in me. Christ can live in us today. If we will with humility accept the truth and let it start changing our lives. We can behold His glory ourselves then in this life in the flesh on this earth. We can behold His glory, His gl the glory of His deity, of His grace and His truth when we peer into the truth of God's Word. We can behold the glory of His preeminence. We can behold the glory of His revelation. And thus to have a close walk with God is to walk with Christ, and that is to study the Bible, specifically the New Testament. So it's through the words of these eyewitnesses like John the Apostle. They made known the power and coming of our Lord. So Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1, 16 through 18. They declared what they heard. They declared what they saw. They declared what they handled, to use the words of John the Apostle. And all of that done, that they can deliver the fellowship that God delivers through people who believe and obey the gospel. Notice John says, we have fellowship with the Father. We want you to have this fellowship. 1 John 1, 1 through 4, and chapter 5, 11 through 13. But there will be no fellowship apart from submission to God's will. We can behold His glory then through the gospel accounts, through the letters, the epistles in the Bible. They're inspired by the Holy Spirit writings. Indeed, we must behold His glory in order to be transformed. And this brings up the place where I'm going to end this part of it. Our living the Christian life is all about us being transformed into the likeness of Christ. This is what I said at the beginning about character development. Romans 8, 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now listen. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You go into chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. In the latter part there, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's all about transformation. It's all about changes. You know, here you used to have these little things they call transformers, and people made millions of dollars on movies called transformers because they could all change. But this is the greatest transforming power on the face of the earth is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it can't do a thing if we don't will to receive it. And so James says, receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able, watch the transformation, change to save your soul. But God can't save us. We don't want Him to save us. So we need to understand these wonderful things. We need to be mindful of them. We need to hold on to them and behold the glory of Jesus Christ in the ways that we study it today. And that people might see Christ living in us as we put in the practice the truths of the New Testament concerning Christian conduct. If you're not a child of God today, we urge you to consider truly the truth of God concerning how one becomes a Christian. There is no other way but to believe that Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, if you have slipped, there is a second law of pardon to repent of your sins, to confess those sins, and to pray God for forgiveness. If you're then subject to the great and wonderful blessings of God through the gospel, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.